I don't know about you, but I'm humbled and inspired at the same time. Um, if my 93-year-old grandmother were here from North Howard County in Arkansas, she would say, mercy. Can I have an amen? <clears throat> that was excellent. Thank you. Our last speaker of the afternoon is Trevor Goring. He's the founder of Images of Justice, a visual exploration of the history and symbolism of law, and is exhibited at over 400 legal conferences in Europe and North America, lectured extensively, and published two legal art history books. His work has appeared in magazines and legal textbooks. <clears throat> Mr. Gorin published a French language arts magazine, uh, co-founded a Canadian contemporary arts organization, and directed a major public arts center for over a decade as well as serving on the Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee for Eastern Canada. He has taught at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and works in Montreal, Canada and Cork City, Ireland. Mr. Trevor Gore. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for staying around to uh, hear and to see um, what a visual artist might have to offer to uh, the trial lawyer community and to the art of advocacy. Uh, that was extraordinary. Um, your, your Pecha Kucha um, was absolutely remarkable. I had never heard of it, and I had learned of it on the plane coming down from Montreal today. Isn't that the way the world works? And um, I'm, going to be, I'm going to do an over-the-top Pecha Kucha. Um, 20 slides is extraordinary. I've got about 350, so get ready for it. <laughs> um, now, you are all primarily highly skilled wordsmiths. You're trained in uh, rhetoric, and you're pretty much logical to your very core. And I am primarily an intuitive artist, and yes, I admit it, quite irrational at times. And um, nonetheless, to be successful in my career, I have to draw on a good number of the skills in which you all excel. Correspondingly, working with AAJ for almost 20 years, um, I have come to believe that it, for you um, to be increasingly successful in trying your cases, that um, you could benefit greatly by drawing on some of the skills <coughs> that artists tend to possess. After all, you know extremely well, it's been pointed out to you by many great speakers here and elsewhere, that um, you know, you're arguing to jurors who are deciding your cases, they learn through seeing, they retain as little as 10% of what they're told verbally, they live in a fast-paced, digital edited world, and they have very short attention spans. Perfe practicing the art of rhetoric and logical verbal persuasion, therefore, no longer really suffices in the courtroom. And there's a pressing need for you all to acknowledge your total lack of aesthetic training. Um, it's reassuring to know, however, that with the right approach, nearly anyone can shift their mode of perception and start to see beyond the deceptive illusions of our everyday reality and begin to understand how visual communications work. Now, I thought I'd very briefly show you um, a, very, a recent painting of mine of Mandela. Um, and the reason why um, is because, you know, he founded the first black law firm in, in South Africa. And I painted um, some spectacles in his pocket. And they are the spectacles of another um, lawyer who practiced law in South Africa, Mahatma Gandhi. And I believe that these spectacles symbolize how Mandela was inspired to see things that others could not see. And so perhaps my question to you today would be, whose glasses are you looking through? So, friends, wordsmiths, 
trial lawyers, lend me your eyes and let's see together differently. Let's lift the veil. Let's strip the veneer of our day-to-day -day vision and let's see our way more clearly in what is clearly a more visually complex world. Now, it was the young Einstein who said that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. He went on to lament that we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. So today, let's remember that gift. Let's acknowledge the intuitive mind. And let's see how visual literacy and aesthetic thought can help us be more intuitive, better creative problem solvers, and better trial advocates for your clients. Let's explore how visual thinking can improve your powers of observation, your ability to identify critical images in your cases, and your capacity to see beyond the illusion of rational thought. Now, you all know that storytelling is central to being effective trial lawyers. We've had two great talks about it this afternoon from Carl and from Mike. Storytelling rules. It's the key to the art of persuasion. And many of you have learned how to frame and develop the theme of your case and to build a compelling hero-centric narrative. But as a visual artist, as a painter on canvas, I do not share the luxury of a timeline in telling my story. There's no beginning, middle, and an end to a canvas. No chance for conventional theme and character development, flashbacks, or repetition. No, the visual artist, painter, photographer, or sculptor must condense a complex subject into one single image that reveals the heart and soul of the matter. We must capture the story in one penetrating gaze, intuitively selected, meticulously structured, and masterfully ex executed, so there can be no escaping the powerful emotional impact. We tend to arrive at this viewpoint through intuitive insight and trial and error. And sometimes great paintings fall into place as though they already existed, and other times have a long, protracted, and painful birth. Certain principles, however, are unchanging. And today I wish to share a few thoughts and anecdotes that illustrate the issues surrounding visual thinking and introduce a few signposts along our journey, the better we hope to see what others may overlook. It's 1991, and I'm in the basement of the Toronto Hilton. I've just walked into one of the first trial law conferences that I've ever attended. And I don't really know what to expect. The guest speaker is billed as a senior trial lawyer, a past president of ATLA, an acronym that means nothing to me at the time. And the main conference room is filled to capacity. The moderator has made her introductions and has stepped up, and the keynote spec. Uh, speaker has stepped forward. No notes in sight, walking around, connecting performer and audience. The speaker launches into Shakespeare's and Cicero's powerful persuasive language. He projects images of great paintings by David and Poussin to illustrate physical courtroom dominance, explaining the technique of anchoring positions in space to the right when arguing damages, to the left when arguing fault, singing quirky nursery rhymes and I, that I've never heard of and I know a good few. He walks around with red apples and yellow lemons, explaining how women see colour differently from men due to the differing levels of optic nerves, more colour sensitive cones in the women's eye, more tone sensitive rods in those of the male. 
He fascinates with his hilarious penetrating analysis of rhetorical techniques, modulating his voice loud now, then almost a whisper. Gestures with arms wide open, inclusive, arms down, pushing back, dismissive. All the time, sight and sound, ears and eyes shaping our perception, focusing our conscious and unconscious minds on how to tell a story. In the present tense, mind you. How to speak of embedded commands and rules of three. How to emulate the great speakers throughout history to persuade an audience to touch their souls. Well, from the very first words, from the first few images at that conference in Toronto, I am, as we English say, gobsmacked. <laughs> For here is the truly unexpected. Here is a kindred spirit. Here is an art form I never knew existed. Later, exhilarated and inspired, I reflect on this experience. You know, I came here wanting to take a break from the esoteric, contemporary, emperor's new clothes art community that I had lived so intensely for years. And what do I find? Trial lawyers are performance artists. I'm out of the cultural frying pan into trial by fire. It's not what I expected, but it's my kind of a world. But then slowly, attending up to 25 legal conferences a year, I realized that this was an exception and that the majority of attorneys I meet are totally unaware of or completely dismiss the importance of creative visual thinking in their work. I realize that something is not quite rotten, but certainly not quite right in your adversarial state of Denmark. And that maybe this is in part an issue of visual literacy and creative confidence, an issue of how we learn or more often don't learn to see, and how we balance or most of the time don't balance how the two hemispheres of our brain operate. Now, you're probably all aware that, very simply put, your left brain hemisphere is your verbal, analytical, rational brain. It thinks serially and reduces its thoughts to numbers, letters, and words. Your right brain hemisphere is your nonverbal and intuitive brain. It thinks in patterns or pictures composed of whole things and processes information all at once, like recognizing the face of an old friend. Now, this division is called brain laterality and has been both embraced and dismissed by the neuroscientific community. As with extraordinary advances in imaging technology, they increasingly discover that the differences are much more about how the two hemispheres use their skills rather than what skills they may possess. Indeed, this uneasy relationship within our brains has played out in the history of ideas might just suggest that society in general is suffering from the consequences of an over-dominant left hemisphere, losing its natural equilibrium. Once again, this concept of having lost the gift of intuition. Now, I would like here to engage you in a brief exercise to illustrate the point. I'm projecting images on the screen that complement my words, and in general, I let them speak for themselves. In this way, their impact is not diluted or undermined by any explanation, an important <coughs> point that we will revisit a little later. Nonetheless, I would ask you now to really focus on the next three images and prepare yourselves as follows. The moment they appear on the screen, say to yourself, without hesitation, what color do you see? 
Are you ready? Now remember, identify the color first. It's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? I think you'll all agree. There's definitely some kind of conflict here in how our brains are processing this information. And it's a simple but clear illustration of the relationship between the two modes of perception. How the two hemispheres of the brain function or conflict. In most cases, it's also a clear indication of which hemisphere dominates. Hence, we can say there are basically two ways of knowing and seeing. The creative, that's Picasso, of course, and the analytical. In truth, we're all pretty much dominated by our left brains because this enables it to function more easily in daily life and make sense of and not be completely overwhelmed by the massive onslaught of stimuli constantly bombarding our senses. Most artists suffer the same conflict of cognition when presented with the slides I just showed you. Most artists, however, are far more easily capable of overriding their left brain and entering the creative right brain zone when engaged in their work. And I should stress here that being creative or artistic doesn't necessarily mean you know how to draw or to play an instrument. Being creative is a way of thinking, a way of viewing the world, and more importantly for attorneys, a way of problem solving. This might solve a few problems. <laughs> so, in over 20 years of working with trial lawyers, I observed and listened closely, and I have to say that a disproportionate number of you are convinced that you are totally without any visual creative ability whatsoever. And I wonder about your previous experiences with the visual creative process. Now, I've taught art to many children and adults and well know how easily students can be deeply discouraged by misguided teaching methods or indeed by the students' own misconceived expectations of what constitutes success in art. Building skills in math, sciences and languages is far easier to evaluate than in the visual arts. So if you allow me to tell you a little story here because I found over the years that it really resonates with many and it also illustrates how we can take back what was once lost. As a young child growing up in bombed out central London after the Second World War, we lived cheerfully unaware of any sense of deprivation, despite strict food and fuel rationing and the limitations of a country recovering from extensive devastation. My parents, both recently demobbed from the Royal Air Force, moved house and I started to attend infant school in the borough of Marylebone in London. Now, the school has art classes, and there is great excitement and anticipation as the colours, brushes and paper are being distributed for our first painting lesson. Most of us have never encountered art materials before, certainly not me. And I just can't help myself. I dive right in, mixing creamy poster colours and trying them out on the irresistible white paper, totally absorbed in the explosion of brilliant colour before me. Suddenly, from above, thunder roars and a furious teacher holds me up in front of the class. Who gave you permission to start? And what's this scribbling mess, Goring? Think you're a little Picasso, do you? Sit this out in the corner and let that be a lesson to you. Well, you can imagine. 
ridiculed, humiliated, bewildered, you name it, I retreat into myself and for years dread even the thought of any kind of art class. Fortunately, I had two older brothers who were always making things at home, and they generously included me in their projects, pesky little brother that I was. And slowly I overcame that crushing experience, and with hesitant steps and the encouragement of wiser teachers, went on to attend art school. But I've always remained acutely conscious of just how powerful and that negative experience was and how profoundly it dim diminished my creative confidence at the time. Only later did I realize just how essential positive encouragement was in healing that traumatic wound. Now, if you weren't traumatized about your creative visual confidence, and I certainly hope you weren't, it was most likely simply ignored and allowed to wither, usually around the age of nine or ten, as the rational, literary, numerical, left brain dominance prevailed in your general education. How often have I heard the same admission? I'm barely capable of drawing even a stick figure. I'm useless at art, but you know my six-year-old is brilliant. You're keen to tell me how non-visual you are, as though it was some kind of guilty confession. I'm just not the visual creative type, I'm told time and time again, manifesting what often appears to be a conscious opting out from any visual creative confidence. Oh, I can't even draw a straight line, is another common remark. Well, hey, I'm here to tell you drawing a straight line is difficult, and stick figures in some paintings go for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in New York galleries and even appear on the currency of coins of Europe. There's no need to feel so bad. In fact, we're all more visual than we think. More than half of the neurons in our brain are process processing visual stimuli. The first six months of a baby's mental development are all about vision and motion. Over 70% of the population have been shown to be visual learners. Albert Einstein, an academic outsider who didn't start talking till he was over two years old, was adamant that his thinking process was visual. The ability to think and communicate in visual terms is part of and of equal importance in the learning process with that of literacy and numeracy. Our educational system, however, totally sidelines this, this, this critical field, sacrificing it on the dubious altar of the intellect. Now, ever since and undoubtedly even before Moses destroyed the sculpture of the golden calf and ground it into powder, strewed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it, there has been a deep-seated hostility against graven images and profound mistrust of sensory experience. After all, a stick in water looks broken. A distant figure, much smaller than it is. A colour changes in relationship according to its adjoining colours. Just look at the drawings of Escher, for instance, or this illusion here to see how deceptive vision may be. These are all regular rectangles. How on earth? Can we believe that these two red shapes are identical? Can any of you believe these red shapes are identical? I can assure you they are. I still can't believe it. Nonetheless, even the first 
Greek psychologists, the sophists, were aware of a troubling contradiction in this skepticism of our sensory experiences. Democritus, who distinguished the dark cognition of the senses from the bright cognition of reasoning, ruefully said, O oh, wretched mind, do you who get your evidence from us, i.e. our senses, yet try to overthrow us? Our overthrow will be your downfall. So the history of thought teaches us that thinking need not, need not be just left-brained and linear, depending on analysis, logic, words, and numbers. Thinking can also be right-brained and analogical, relying on complex images, tones, colors, and spatial relationships. The gestalt. Successful advocacy needs both kinds of thinking. And I may, may I respectfully suggest that you just need to start observing impartially the way your six-year-old does and blow away all those learned preconceptions and assumptions that cloud your vision and that prevent you from seeing what is rather than what you think is. You know, we all used to believe that our brains, once formed in early adulthood, were incapable of change. Now, thanks to neuroscience and especially neuroplasticity, we know that our brains remain flexible and that we can modify and refocus our mental habits and adapt our brains to changing circumstances. So my friends of a certain age, if you're looking for rejuvenation, forget the plastic surgery, cause neuroplasticity is where it's at. In fact, artists, and trial lawyers share much in common. And sometimes the similarities are striking and surprisingly revealing. We are all equally self-employed, risk takers, driven by a higher calling, determined, dogged, and inspired all at once. Feast or famine is the norm. And yes, you're very welcome to invite me out for dinner this evening if you've just got a great verdict. Then, of course, there are all those mountains of paper we use. Not to mention a weakness for living high and to the full, a firm conviction in carpe diem. I often ask my clients, what moment or figure in legal history strikes a chord with them and reflects their cherished values as a litigator? It's extraordinary how often the reply is unhesitating and precise. And I'm sure that it's because trial lawyers, like artists, have heroes that inspire them and core values that sustain them. For instance, Marcus Tullius Cicero accuses Verres, the corrupt governor of Sicily. Ambrogio Lorenzetti paints the effects of corrupt government in medieval Italy. This is in the town hall of Siena. John Adams defends the British soldiers after the Boston Massacre, one of his finest moments. Francisco de Goya paints the firing squad execution of masses of Spanish countrymen by French soldiers. US Supreme Court Robert H. Jackson prosecutes members of the Nazi leadership at the Nuremberg trials. Picasso paints his iconic image of the tragedies of war, Guernica. Clarence Darrow argues against the death penalty in the Leopold Loeb trial, Chicago, 1925. 
Andy Warhol paints his electric chairs. These are powerful, shared manifestations of a passion for truth and justice that illustrate a lasting common bond between visual artists and trial lawyers through the ages. Now, in developing visual acuity for attorneys, I believe it's helpful to acknowledge the remarkable relationship between art and the law that exists in all cultures since earliest times. So these are the famous Ravello mosaics of Justinian, who, of course, codified all the laws. It's a subject I've been exploring and developing in my Images of Justice project for over 20 years, and it's worthy of a whole series of lectures. But for now, let's just touch on one or two of the most iconic images. Uh, King Alfred established the first known juries in the UK. Now, the ancient Egyptians knew a thing or two about the importance of iconography and made sure that they communicated their laws with the aid of powerful visual imagery. The scales of justice, that ubiquitous symbol of the law, derives specifically from the Egyptian last judgment. When the heart of the deceased is weighed against the feather, the hieroglyph of truth. And it is weighed by the Anub uh, Anubis, the jackal-headed god. Toth is the Egyptian scribe who records the result. And if your heart is lighter than the feather, then you pass into the afterworld, which is what everybody wants. But if not, you are devoured by Amit, a terrifying creature, this guy here, who is part crocodile, part lion, and part hippopotamus. Now that's some lineup of potent imagery, if ever there was. And similarly, Ma'at, the Egyptian goddess, the original Lady Justice, who personifies truth, equity, and ethics, she wears her symbol, the hieroglyph of truth, the white feather. If ever you see, you're looking at Egyptian iconography and you see this white feather, that's who it is. It's Ma'at. And this, um, this feather can be found today on the other side of the planet, here in North America, in the ceremonial um, uh, uh, festivities and activities of North American Native Indian tribes. In Canada, in fact, many of our Native Indians, when, when going into court, will not swear on a Bible. Um, they will hold an eagle feather as their symbol of truth. Um, the blindfolded figure of justice only starts to appear in Europe in the fifth, late 15th century and is generally, generally understood to represent judgment uncorrupted or impartial. In fact, however, there are considerable negative connotations of this symbolism, and they can be found at the outset um, in such illustrations as this one, the fool blindfolding justice by the great Albrecht Dürer as early as 1494. It's confusing double-edged imagery. Why? Sometimes I think that my art's headband must have slipped down or something. Or, or maybe Justice's eyes are bandaged to keep her seeing the pain caused by the sanctions imposed in the name of the law. Well, questions for another day. For there are no end of wonderful images and artworks throughout the centuries that testify to the art law connection. And I'd encourage you to seek some of these out for your own pleasure and enjoyment. And indeed, as we shall see later, to help you develop your creative visual thinking skills. OK. You are wordsmiths, and you feel more comfortable with words than with images. But jurors are most likely to be more comfortable with images than with words. And there is much teaching now in advanced trial lawyer circles, reptiles abound, about how decision making is possibly rooted in the limbic system, the deep-seated old part of the brain where gut feeling and primitive emotion reside and how you cannot present your cases assuming that your arguments will be received with rational analysis. 
Now, if you accept this theory, and it seems to generate significant results, uh, you must understand the importance of the emotional component of storytelling and increasingly accept the fact that since the unconscious mind plays such an important role in decision making, the work of trial lawyers must include impressionistic visual persuasion to complement and augment logical presentation of fact. You need to be able to pluck critical, vivid images from your client's testimony and propagate those images in the mind of the jury. Next time you take a deposition, try and be aware of the visual images that underlie what is said. A seemingly insignificant remark can trigger an image that might just pack the emotional punch you need to sway the jury. My late good friend and brilliant trial attorney John O'Quinn from Houston always astonished me in that he still actually read Aristotle's rhetoric on a regular basis. If you knew him, he was the most unlikely character to read Aristotle's rhetoric. But then the ancient Greeks knew what they were doing and so did John. They used a rhetorical figure of speech called phanopia or using a word or words to throw a visual image, image onto the listener's imagination. And this interplay between the verbal and the visual has to be a major contributing factor in successful trial advocacy. But remember, when presenting images verbally or otherwise, resist the urge to talk too much about them or to interpret them too much. They will work best when you refrain from explaining their significance, symbolism or metaphor. I can't impress that upon you enough. If you've got a great image, don't talk about it. Try it someday. Choose a painting you don't know and look at it closely. I'm sorry. Choose a painting you don't know and look at it closely. The more you hold out against the impulse to find narrative meaning, the more aware you become of the picture itself. And those pictures that provide prolonged aesthetic interest often do so by including the recognizable, but also the unexpected, some element that disturbs our expectations. This is sometimes called poignancy or the gratuitous element and can deliver great emotional impact. Identifying such significant images in your trial can be hugely beneficial to your case. So what can you do to enhance your visual thinking and develop your creative problem-solving skills? What can you do to temporarily deactivate or override your left brain dominance and give full rein to the right brain's uninhibited potential? Though you probably all doubt it, with the right approach, most of you could learn to draw reasonably well within a few weeks, developing your perception of edges, space, relative angles and proportions, and light and shadow. But for the time being, a very useful and educational method developed in collaboration between the Museum of Modern Art and Harvard is a cognitive, structured approach to the study of art designed to improve observational and critical thinking skills. Here are some basic habits that can improve your daily practice of law as outlined in this visual thinking strategy. Make careful observation a habit and learn to describe what you see. Avoid preconceptions. Consider multiple right 
answers. Promote wonder. Embrace ambiguity. Appreciate context. I think this sailor uh, just died the day before yesterday. Yeah, I'm sure you all know this very famous photograph just on the declaration of uh, at the end of war, the Second World War. Think metaphorically. And perhaps above all, recognize your and your client's shared humanity. Thinking about art or aesthetic thought is rich and complex and has been conclu conclusively shown to improve observation, speculation, and reasoning on the basics of evidence. It is precisely because art is so richly complex that the possibilities for learning from it are endless. Carl Bettinger, in the introduction to his brilliant recent book, Twelve Heroes, One Voice, quotes Marcel Proux. The real voyage of discovery lies not in seek seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And although the great French writer obviously didn't mean discovery in a legal sense, his quote could not be more appropriate for how you conduct your discovery in a case. For fresh, unbiased, perceptive vision serves to eliminate confusion and reveal the whole. A limited palette and simple design hones the narrative language. And I simply can't resist backing up to this one. I mean, when you think about it, poor old Lance Armstrong. I mean, he achieved so much. When I was on drugs, I couldn't even find my bike. <laughs> the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words rings true still and can bring complex images of life into sharp focus and strike resonant chords in the inner subconscious. Being all eyes as well as all ears is essential in successfully trying your cases. So why are so many classic female figures of justice blindfolded? Could it be because, and here there's a little viewer discretion warning, um, could it be because sometimes images are so powerful or so poignant they are not welcome in the court? I respectfully urge you to harness this forbidden power, identifying, simplifying, and framing the poignant images in your case, and then projecting those images into the minds of your listeners. Cast your eye with confidence and clarity in your work. Be verbal painters of significant moments in your client's story. See intensely, see beyond the public face of rational thinking. Reveal the emotions that are the true source of decision-making and action. I don't know about you, but I prefer justice with her eyes wide open. Thanks for listening. Thanks for seeing. And here's looking at you.